Now in the third video in this series, I stated that it's standard practice to perform a failure analysis or a forensic study on reported failures. And I would like to look at some of the cases which I've already introduced in these videos. I wouldn't dare to use the words failure analysis because I just don't have the necessary information to hand. But even so, with the scraps of data which we do have, it will be possible to make some very interesting inferences and some conclusions. I firstly want to look at the failure of the rear axle of the Isuzu D-Max, which was reported in the Mongrel Dog Productions video on YouTube. Now we don't know an awful lot about this failure. They report that they were driving along the Canning Stop route one morning when suddenly the rear wheel fell off and they were understandably all very shocked. What we do know is that these vehicles have a live rear axle, they have a car steel casing and that they are a semi-floating design, although in this instance it was definitely the casing that failed and not the half shaft. Unfortunately, we don't have any good photos of the fracture surfaces, although this side-on view is quite informative. On the left-hand side, which was the underside of the axle, the fracture surface appears planar, and on the right-hand side, it's jagged. Now, we may assume that we had a fatigue crack, which was um, fully through thickness and growing around the circumference on the left, until it reached critical size and then we got fully ductile failure. Now these cracks will start off at an initiation site. They will start off as part through uh, cracks and they will slowly grow through the thickness until the point of breakthrough. And this can take quite some time. However, at the point of breakthrough, we probably already used up uh, well in excess of 95% of the fatigue life and the crack growth will accelerate rapidly until we get final failure. Now I'm not familiar with these axles, so I looked up some pictures on the internet and I have to say I find that they are very neatly detailed and many of them don't have any welded attachments on the underside at all. Although I did find one with this rather ugly little bracket and this would uh, almost certainly have acted as a crack initiation site. Now if the failed axle didn't have any welded attachments, we have to assume that there was probably a casting defect inside, and that's a bit of a worry, because the crack would have been largely undetectable. However, the saving grace is that at the temperatures encountered on the ca canning stop route, the steel is well above the transition temperature and it's very tough and it means that the critical crack size at the point of failure is going to be quite significant. Now from the point that the crack goes through thickness we are going to get an oil leak. Initially just seepage but it will then develop and we're going to have droplets of oil on the ground. And providing regular underbody inspections are performed, there's every chance to detect the leak. And I would emphasize that if there are any unexplained oil leaks, they need to be thoroughly investigated. As a final point, I'd say that if, if they were traveling in a very cold region, Siberia or whatever, the situation would have been quite different. Firstly, it would have been very difficult to carry out meaningful underbody inspections. And also, the steel would have been much more brittle at those temperatures, and, and the critical crack size would have been very small and quite probably undetectable at the point of failure. I now want to look at the failure of the front axle of the Defender 130, which has been driven around the world by Grizzly and Bear. So what do we know about it? The vehicle had been in storage in Kyrgyzstan for five months over the winter. The owners flew back in, took it out of storage, and they set off again. Within a fairly short distance, they hit a moderate pothole, and bang, the front axle went. Now, there's two basic theories about what the problem was. One is that there's a design flaw in these uh, front hubs, or at least in the ball housings. And the second is a manufacturing defect. Let's set the first one aside for the moment, 
because I'm going to look at that in a separate video and let's look at the possibility of the manufacturing defect. Now when the video was published on YouTube there was quite a reaction and many commentators were of the opinion that this was appalling Land, of, uh, Land Rover quality that the steel used for the ball housings had the brittleness of glass and you only had to touch a pothole for them to shatter. Well, let's look at the reality of this. Now, for steel to shatter under shock loading, it has to have very low toughness and, in other words, be well below the t uh, transition temperature. Now, if they were travelling in Siberia, this would be very plausible. You have temperatures minus 40, minus 50... But at the time of the accident in Kyrgyzstan, there was free water on the road, there was some snow on the verges, but it was sleeting. And my guess is that it was probably not below a freezing point. And it's actually very difficult to make steel which has a transition temperature as high as this. And certainly not Ford steel, which is what's actually used for these ball housings. The other thing to look at is the impact itself. Now they were travelling not too fast. It was a moderate severity pothole. It's a sort of impact which we all suffer from time to time. We try to avoid it, but it happens. But 999 times out of a thousand, it's not going to have a catastrophic effect. So what really did happen? If we look at the fracture surface, there are two, if not three, clearly distinct phases. And I would add, I would dearly have loved to have had this examined by a qualified metallurgist in a lab. But clearly that's not possible now. On the left, we got a relatively uh, smooth crack surface. And this would indicate fatigue crack growth. And on the right, we've got a much more jagged uh, failure surface. And that would have been a ductile fracture. If we look closely at the knuckle area, there seems to be a crack initiation site. Now, after initiation, the crack would initially have grown through the thickness. It would have, would have penetrated the wall thickness and then worked its way around the circumference until it reached the critical size and hitting the pothole was merely the final nail in the coffin. The indications are that the steel was quite tough, both from the large uh, critical crack size the fatigue crack seems to have covered about 160 degrees of the circumference and also from the jagged ductile fracture surface. So I think we can discount the possibility of crap, very brittle steel, which failed prematurely. Now it's of interest to note how the crack initiated. There could have been a manufacturing defect. There could also have been mechanical damage to the surface during the life of the component. Well, the fact is that after a sufficient number of stress cycles, crack initiation is going to occur at any stress razor, such as at the knuckle of the ball housing. Now, in the studies I conducted in part five, I did look at the effect of the wider tyres and the wheel spacers which this vehicle was fitted with, and I concluded that the fatigue life was reduced by a factor of more than five. So um, the actual life would have been less than 20% of the original component. And that's very significant. So what I conclude, um, we've got a vehicle here, a big heavy vehicle. It's doing extended mileages off-road and um, on bad quality roads. We got the wider tyres, we got the wheel spacers, we get crack initiation, fatigue crack growth, we hit the pothole and we get final failure. An interesting final question is where the failed ball housing actually came from. Now the owner said that he bought the vehicle, very well used, from Poland, but he doesn't know a lot about its early life. He also said that when the replacement ball housings arrived, genuine parts, they were visibly of much better quality and they also had a manufacturing batch number stamped in indicating that they were manufactured under a quality control system. The failed items didn't have this. We don't really know, but it may well be that the failed items were aftermarket parts. And a word of warning to Defender owners, if you are going to replace your ball housings,
And this does happen, particularly in northern Europe, if the surfaces get corroded. It is well worthwhile going for the genuine parts because these are made out of steel forgings, whereas many of the aftermarket items are steel castings and they do have a shorter life. You most certainly would want the best quality parts if you were doing a round-the-world trip like this one. Finally, I want to look at the Jeep axle failures. Now, I first came across this on the JP Freaks website, uh, although looking around, I found that there are absolutely dozens of examples on the internet. Now, these are quite different to the cases we've looked at so far. Hitherto, we've looked at uh, failures which have occurred during overlanding. And in overlanding, you tend to get high mileages. And although you're traveling on fairly bad roads and off-road tracks, in the overall scale of things, they often aren't that demanding. Whereas the Jeep failures tend to be associated with uh, extreme off-roading and rock climbing. And the problem seems to be one of fracture rather than fatigue. I'd like to point out that these axle casings, be they made from castings or hot form tubes, that they're all made from carbon steel. And that at normal working temperatures, carbon steel is a ductile material, unlike, for example, cast iron or high strength alloy steel. And that if you load it past the yield point, it will generally deform or bend and it won't fracture. So something's going on here to cause these unexpected axle failures. Now looking at this particular fracture, you will see that the fracture itself started at the end of the welded attachment. It went out into the parent material and that thereafter it was a ductile failure. And you can tell that from the jagged fracture surfaces. So there was no problem with the quality of the steel. Contrast this with a classic brittle fracture, which is very low energy. Now in the engineering world, you often find that load-bearing structure is well designed and is perfectly fit for purpose, but that the problem occurs with the welded attachments, which often don't receive the same attention to detail. And I think that's what's happened in the present case. If we look at the welded attachments on this axle, I got two problems with them. The first and lesser problem is to do with the cheek plate, which is the one at the front. And you'll see that the welds don't go the full length of the attachment. Now, in the world I come from, the offshore oil industry, you wouldn't detail it like that. The welds would go to the end, there'd be a return at the ends, and furthermore, the welds would be profiled by grinding to minimise any stress concentrations. And the fact that this hasn't occurred tells me a lot. The second, a major problem, is to do with the longitudinal attachment. Now, when you've got a longitudinal attachment on a load-bearing member, you tend to find that the stresses migrate out of the load-bearing member and into the attachment, but that at the end of the attachment, the stresses have to find their way back again into the load-bearing member, and if there isn't a smooth transition, you're going to get a stress concentration. And this is recognised in the DNV fatigue design code where this detail is given a reduced class F categorization. Now at the end of the longitudinal gusset we've got a particular set of problems. Firstly we've got the stress concentration. It means under fluctuating stresses we're going to get early crack initiation but also that for a given level of stress in the parent material the crack driving force is going to be similarly magnified. Secondly, the initial crack is going to be um, adjacent to the weld and it's going to be exposed to the welding residual stresses, unless of course the axle was stress relieved, which I'm sure it wasn't. And these are near yield stress level and they're tensile stresses acting on the crack faces and tending to drive the crack forward. Thirdly, the crack is going to be inside the heat-affected zone where the fracture toughness is reduced. And fourthly, when you put a shock load into the system because you're rock crawling or whatever, the dynamic fracture toughness, again, is considerably reduced. So in short, I think we've got the perfect storm for fast fracture. In summary, 
we go out off-roading we get a fatigue track forming very early on um, we put a big shock load into it and owing to the adverse combination of circumstances it goes bang and we get a fast fracture so that's the end of this video I wouldn't even try to call my efforts a proper forensic study because I just didn't have the necessary information to hand. But even with the scraps of data I had, I think I came pretty close to establishing why these particular axles failed. We had two cases of fatigue failure and one of uh, ductile fracture. And importantly, I got some very strong pointers which will help me to make recommendations about how to prevent similar failures in the future which is going to appear in my next video in this series.